Today's topic is something called dielectrics, a weird word that we'll explain in a little bit. All right. An insulator in an electric field is called a dielectric. This name will have a little bit of meaning, better meaning later, but it really comes down to a di, meaning to electric. Uh, generally, we'll talk about it dielectrics in the context of capacitors. So here we have over here a capacitor that is vacuum insulated, which is a fancy way of saying there's nothing between the plates, just empty space. Uh, empty space is an insulator, and so we get that uh, this is a technical truth thing, if, if still weird. And then we compare that to a dielectric filled capacitor where we have some insulating material between the two. You can imagine that in terms of technology, this is much more likely than this because the structural integrity would generally be stronger because the uh, dielectric could absorb stresses if need be. All right, when we put the uh, dielectric in the capacitor and put charge on the capacitor, we create an electric field. And because of that, the insulator ends up getting polarized. That is, some of the positives move towards the along the field lines towards the positive end, and some of the negatives move towards along the field lines to the negative end. Now, it doesn't end up that they actually move. It's an insulator, so they can't really move much. They just shift a little bit. They stu they're stuck where they are, but the, the positives end up spending more time on the left, and the negatives end up more on try more on the right of their own little things and then we can see that we can now group uh what would be a good color da, da, da. we can group that these two are now neutral and these two are now neutral and these are neutral and let's see if we can do some others so those two go together and those two go together and say those two go together and maybe these two and these two those two guys go together um, and so what we can end up doing is seeing that when we've done all of that it is as if we get a sheet of positive charge at one end and a sheet of negative charge at the other end because the guys in the middle have all bonded in different ways so as to cancel each other whoops missed one but the ones on the end can't because they're too far away from each other. That induces uh, a surface charge with the weird use of eta that the textbook likes. Um, it induces an electric field as if these were like a little mini capacitor themselves, two sheets of charge separated by some distance. So there's an induced charge this way. The rightward pointing induced electric field counteracts some but not all of the external leftward pointing field. And they try and show this here by spacing them out a little bit to show that it's weaker, but points in the other way. It's these two sheets of charge that give this the name a dielectric. The induced charge sheets create an induced, an induced field, duh, which acts counter to and thus weakens the original electric field. So here's our original electric field. We've polarized and shifted around stuff in here so it induced some other little electric field and so there's a smaller electric field between the capacitors. As far as we're concerned, since we don't see this, the effect of it is if the field is weaker. It still points in the original direction, but it's smaller. We then define the dielectric constant kappa, a Greek letter that is annoyingly like K. It's the Roman letter K, but notice that this little tiny letter is lowercase kappa, even though it looks like an uppercase K. And that's frustrating. You have to remember to write it about the right size. A capital kappa looks like a capital K. Uh, and we define, let's get some actual stuff here, that the dielectric constant kappa is defined as the original field divided by the new field. Why do we define it that way? Turns out it's useful. In a second, we'll see why it's nice to think of that way. This is essentially the factor by which the electric field is weakened. In other words, if kappa is 2, you've weakened the field by a half. If kappa is 3, now it's down to a third, and so on. We can see that kappa is unitless. It's electric field over electric field, so there's no dimensions. And it's always greater than or equal to 1. 
It's an intrinsic property of the material and is larger for more easily, easily polarized materials. The easier it is to get these things to shift around, the larger kappa is. The more they will shift, and therefore the stronger the internal field, and therefore the weaker the actual final field. By definition, vacuum has kappa equal to 1. And we usually take that air has kappa equal 1 at least out to three decimal places. You have to go to the fourth decimal place to see a kappa different than 1 for air. All right, let's call the voltage across the vacuum filled capacitor V sub 0, and the voltage across the dielectric filled one just V. Here we're generally using zero as meaning reference to the vacuum. And we can see that our, velo our voltage is E times D, and that's E naught over kappa times D which is 1 over kappa uh, times E naught times D, which is 1 over kappa times the original voltage. So when we put the capacitor in, we reduced the voltage for an equivalent charge by that much. This is, of course, assuming the capacitor is uh, charge isolated, so there's no charge flow flowing. Then we can say that this is the capacitance is Q over V, which is Q over 1 over kappa times V0, which is kappa times Q over V0, or kappa times the original capacitance. Inserting a dielectric increases the capacitance. We can store more charge on a capacitor when it's filled with dielectric. This is why we define the dielectric the way we did actually, just say that the dielectric factor multiplies the capacitance, and that's convenient. All right. A vacuum filled capacitor has capacitance C0. It's connected to a battery with EMF, EMF VB until it's fully charged. Then the battery is removed. A slab of insulator with dielectric constant kappa is placed in the gap of the capa capacitor, but it is, remember, isolated. What can be said about the energy stored in the capacitor? So you might remember that we had that the energy stored in the capacitor is 1 half times Q times V, which is going to be 1 half times Q times Q over C, or 1 half Q squared over C. I use this one because the charge is constant since the battery is isolated. So it's nice to have that. And then this becomes, that's our original energy. Our new energy, of course, is 1 half Q, over, Q squared over C0. So the ratio of new energy to old energy is the original capacitance over the new capacitance, but the new capacitance is kappa times the original, so it becomes 1 over kappa, which means since kappa is always more than 1, it is decreased. All right. Every physical material has a characteristic electric field strength at which the dielectric fails and a spark is produced. We call this the dielectric strength of the material. For air, it's about 3... 3 times 10 to the 6 volts per meter. About 3 million volts per meter, you will pull apart all the uh, insulator dielectric, the, the polarized atoms, and you'll have actual current flow. It will stop being an insulator, it'll become a uh, conductor, at least briefly, and those charges will try and meet, meet up. This is where lightning strikes and such come from.